Good evening, everybody, and I'm very happy to be able to welcome you. I know that I always say that I'm happy to welcome people coming to the lectures, but today I'm especially welcome because I can welcome you to the new premises of the British Institute at Ankara. And I'm therefore would like to especially um, welcome the representative of other, of other British institutions, uh, Najma Wuaz Khan, Head of uh, Communications and Projects from the British Embassy and other representatives of the Embassy, uh, and Cherry Goff, Director of the British Council Turkey, as well as Dr. D uh, Didier Bois Khan, member of the advisory group of the Cultural Protection Fund. But today we are actually not opening the premises in their totality. Today we are listening to the inaugural lecture of the BIA Wolfson Foundation Conference Room. Now, several people already told me, ah, çok havalı oldunuz, <laughs> Wolfson Foundation. It's actually very simple. We were able to make this into a, we think, nice conference room thanks to a grant from the Wolfson Foundation. So we think it's only correct that it's called the Wolfson Foundation Conference Room. We thought it appropriate that the inaugural lecture would be given by one of ours. And uh, Dr. Ishalai Gursu works on the Sarat project here in the <coughs> Institute. Sarat, as many of you may know, stands for Safeguarding Archaeological Assets of Turkey. <coughs> and it is a large grant award of the Cultural Protection Fund. Another fund that many of you may know, the Cultural Protection Fund is a 30 million pound fund that supports efforts and projects to keep cultural heritage sites and objects safe, as well as recording conservation and restoration of cultural heritage. It also provides opportunities to work with local communities for training and education with the aim to enable and empower them in the long term to value care and benefit from their cultural heritage themselves. The Cultural Protection Fund concentrates around 12 countries, mainly located in the Middle East. And um, it, is, it accepts, actually, which is quite remarkable, accepts applications globally. The only uh, condition is that one of the partners has to be located in one of the fund's target countries. The grant the funding comes from the department for, and I always miss here, but digital, uh, sea, culture, media and sport, and is administered by the British Council, British Council London. Now the BIA, like I said, has been awarded a large grant from the CPS, the CPF, and in that grant we partner with ICOM UK and ANAMET, so the research centre for Anatolian uh, cultures from the Koch University in, um, in Istanbul. The project, Sarat, has three legs. The first one is an online course, which is at this very moment being prepared, on safeguarding and rescuing archaeological assets in Turkish, uh, in Turkey. And it is, and that is quite special, it's the first time ever, it's going to be in Turkish. Uh, so we are going to, we are most probably, it's going to be available from spring 2019 onwards. So we are working hard on this together with Koch University. A second leg is work with collectors and journalists. And a third one is a nationwide survey on perception of heritage in Turkey. And it is on this, of course, that we are going to hear tonight. So it's high time that we finally come to the speaker, Dr. Ushalai Gürsu. Ushalai started working at the BIA uh, as a Cultural Heritage Management Postdoctoral Fellow in January 2013, in spite of the fact that her doctor was, doctoral thesis was not yet finished, but she finalised it when she was here. So first she worked on the heritage management uh, project from the BIA, focusing on southwest Turkey, and especially on Pisidia, where she developed a regional heritage management plan. Um, I jumped to what she's been doing with us too early because she studied first in Boazici and afterwards in Koch University and then had her, did her PhD in uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Lucca in Italy. 
So, first of all, the, P the PIA Heritage Management Project uh, in Pisidia, largely funded by the Headley Trust. Afterwards, we also worked together parallel and afterwards together on the Living Emitum Runes project, which was a sustainable development fund project uh, financed by the British Academy. And then now, Sarat. So, and it is on Sarat that we are going to hear from Ushelai. After the lecture, we can have a question and answer session. So, please enjoy the lecture. Thank you very much, Luke, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you all for coming here and being with us this evening. It's a great honor for me to be able to do the first talk of the BIA at these new premises. And it's a pleasure to see you all here. So thank you once again. Um, first thing, you might be wondering already what the keypads are for. It's, it's a surprise. Uh, I'll tell you more during the lecture, but I would like you to keep them safe. So we will play a small game with the keypads later. The survey that we will be having a closer look this evening all together is uh, a part of Safeguarding Archaeological Assets of Turkey project, as Lut just explained. Um, Sarat is funded through uh, the British Council's Cultural Protection Fund, and we are grateful not only for the financial support that we receive from Cultural Protection Fund, but also the enthusiasm that they share about this project. It really has a huge positive impact on its delivery. And I also would like to tell you that most of the Sarat members are here uh, with us this evening. Uh, Gül Pulhan is here. She is the co uh, coordinator of the project. Uh, Nurban Kocaslan, who is our uh, media specialist, she is here. Uh, Özlem Başdoğan is here, who is the media specialist. And Janar is uh, joining us for uh, these kinds of occasions, taking wonderful photos. So. Uh, if you have any questions about Sarat, you have the right people in the audience, and after the talk you can, you can uh, ask all your questions. And you can also go to the website, which is proudly li live, uh, saratproject.com, to receive more information about the project itself. Um, so, this evening's talk is going to <coughs> concentrate on the nationwide survey that was undertaken within this project, as I was just saying. Um, before I present you the results, I'll tell you, I would like to tell you three things. The first one is motivation to undertake such a, such a survey. Because you might be wondering, like, if you have a project on safeguarding and protection, why would you start with doing a nationwide survey? It's because we would like to first understand the people's existing attachment or lack of it, so that we can build something on it, so that we can expect people to safeguard the archaeological assets. Because for the sustainability of the archaeological record, which is something that Sarat is focusing on, we <coughs> believe that this is a very important step. So this is why we started with undertaking a big public survey. And the public survey that we had in mind was not something that we could do on our own. It had to be undertaken professionally. So it's not that when, when we are talking about we asked 3,601 3, people, it's not that this team went to each single people, but there was a professional company behind it. And Konda Research Company, who has a vast experience in conducting social research, was our savior. And here in this photo you see uh, Dear Bekir Ardır, who has been very helpful with his intellectual guidance and vast experience in, in conducting such, such surveys. Um, and while we were preparing the 65 questions that were asked in the survey, we also did some brainstorming sessions, and some of you have joined those sessions, and thank you for coming again to hear the results. Uh, it, was a, it was a great pleasure to be able to discuss these ideas when they were still immature and make them mature altogether. Here you see two photos from um, the first two brainstorming sessions that we did at the old premises, so this also gives us a chance to see our uh, dear Tahran Yirmidort building once more. And then the other two were conducted in one in Anemet in Istanbul and the other one in Mardin Museum. Uh, and after all these <coughs> discussions, um, sorry, I jumped a bit ahead. After all these discussions, we um, put together these um, potential questions, so to say. And these potential questions were turned into a pilot study. 
and Konda made a pilot test. So, but what I mean by this is that a group of researchers from Konda went and asked these questions to a group of people, and then they and then we finalized the questionnaire form because some questions were too complicated, some words were too difficult to understand, and we were warned by by Konda's uh, experienced team that some questions might not have worked, and we have seen that they didn't work, and so we had to change them. And another point that I would like to make before we move on to the results is what are we going to do with this data? Um, we are going to, the next step <coughs> is to do some in-depth interviews with some of the people that participated to this questionnaire. We would like to do this because there are some concepts that we want to focus on and be able to understand more in depth. And we already have formulated a pool of volunteers, so to say, some of the people that were um, questioned, th that they received this questionnaire, said that they would like to be a part of um, an in-depth interview session. So we are going to determine the categories and we are going to say, okay, young group uh, with university education who has visited an archaeological site and who would like to go back. So we go and interview those people to understand their motivations so that we can build more information from there. And all this information is going to be used on workshops that we call socioeconomic incentives workshops. These will be conducted in some of the cities, so we will go to these cities to, uh, to meet with heritage professionals and to share this data in order to tell them possible strategies looking at this big data that might make um, the archaeological heritage in their city much more relevant to the communities in that city. And another aspect is, of course, academic publications. And uh, this is going to add up to BIA's um, already about to exist uh, <laughs> volume on public archaeology. Uh, and uh, the last one are the policy recommendations. So. Let's get to know a little bit of our respondents, these 3,600 people. Who are they? Firstly, uh, let's have a look at the map of where the questionnaires were conducted. So what, the, um, what the, these kinds of nation representative uh, methodology uses is not going to each single city, but they identify 12 regions rather than the, four, uh, rather than the official seven and they go to selected cities and they gather information that's going to be representative of the whole Turkey. And the ones that you see are more blue <coughs> are the ones that were, um, that were, that were more, more interviews were conducted because of the population. So you see Istanbul is the highest. And there were some regions that we wanted to have a closer look. Those are the reasons why we, ha we have different uh, intensity. 48% is female, 52 males. Age groups, more or less the same. We divided into t three age groups. Um, education, you can see the um, distribution of education, and we can say 49 below high school because they recategorize it into three uh, categories 40, 49 below um, high school, 33% high school and 18% university or graduate. Um, another, another important demographics is the settlement type, and this is, has been divided as rural, urban, and metropolitan. Um, and if you look at the official um, division right now um, in Turkey, 92% of the people are living in urban centers and eight is living in the rural centers. But this is not what we use here because we, first of all, they add um, metropolitan because that's a big division. And also this 8% um, is not reflect reflecting the reality because there has been a very recent change in the, in the municipality law. Uh, and the, the, all those small villages which still have the rural characteristics have become the neighborhoods of Büyükşehir um, Belediyes, so metropolitans. So that's why those populations do not any longer count as rural, but that's a big difference in the, in the lifestyle, to say. So 
this reflects more the situation right now. You can also see that there are some different groups of monthly house uh, income. Um, there were other groups, there were other questions about the demographics, but I'm not going to go too much into detail. But one thing that Honda, as a research company, uses, and it is quite uh, determinant in the, in the choices made by different groups of people in Turkey, is categorizing, is asking people directly themselves how they would identify themselves. So one category is modern, we can also call it secular, modern, direct Turkçesi. The second is traditional conservative, geleneksel muhafazakar. And the third is religious conservative, dindar muhafazakar. And here you can see the, you can see the percentages that uh, were uh, used in the, in the survey. We can compare the different settlement types and lifestyles we can also look at their choices, as I was saying. For example, let's look at social media usage, which is an important um, information. Overall, in Turkey, 78% of the people are using one or another social media. And this is how the dis distribution is, looks like. And having mentioned social media, uh, please do follow Sarat on social media. You can <laughs> see a, a piece of paper just there. And it follows all the Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and, <laughs> and we would be happy if, if we stay in touch. When we come to the results that relate more to archaeology, I can say that this survey had three main pillars. The first thing we wanted to understand was the understanding of archaeology by the communities. I'll come back to this. Engagement with archaeological assets and past in general. And the last one is the general approaches towards archaeological assets. So in the category of understanding of archaeology, we ask questions to understand the level of knowledge, familiarity with archaeology, archeo <laughs> the work of archaeologists, the archaeological sites themselves, old civilizations, <coughs> as well as values assigned to archaeological ruins and ownership of archaeological artifacts. So, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce the results of this data. So, the first um, question, what comes to your mind when you hear the word archaeology, is um, we see that many of the people, 36%, do come up with excavation or Science of excavation. Maybe what, what may attract your attention here is that 14% didn't give an answer, 3% said, I do not know. So there's that 17% of uh, no, no answer. But others did give some, some sort of an answer referring to an understanding of, of archaeology. When it comes to the knowledge regarding the ownership of the artifacts, of archaeological assets, here we see a huge awareness, so to say, like 85% of the respondents said that they belong to the state. So there was not much confusion there. And what values do you think archaeological ruins have? Came up with intangible, manevi, like 60% of the people refer to intangible values as the most important category. So as I was mentioning these in-depth interviews following this questionnaire results, one of the things that we would really like to understand is what does it mean? What does this an intangible mean? And we, we understand something, but do the respondents mean the thing that we understand? So we would like to compare those two perceptions, so to say. And um, here are some of the star sites. And uh, now I'm, I'm going to present you how <coughs> bright our star sites uh, to, the, to the respondents. Uh, I mean, you, you see the list, there are 10 of them. And we asked people, do you know these sites? So all the names were read one by one. And first of all, I'll present you the general 
Turkey responses. I'll give you a second so that you can have a look. Starts with Ayasofya, Topkapı, Efes, Hasankeyf, Çatalhöyük, which to me actually seeing Çatalhöyük much higher than Boğazköy was quite interesting. We'll come back to this later. And then let's have a look at Istanbul. All the percentages have risen up. Uh, the the list, listing is the same, so there is no change in the listing. But 94% of the people living in Istanbul who responded to, to the questionnaire know about Hagia Sophia as well as Topkapı. And you can see the, the rest of the list. Now let's go to <coughs> Antalya. And maybe not very, uh, it's not very surprising to see that Aspendos enters the list now. Uh, but still, I keep wondering, like, 43% of the people living in Antalya know about Aspendos. What about 70, uh, 57 that <laughs> says, I haven't heard of it? That's, but that's another story. But these are... And the differences in the local... and data that comes from <laughs> different places, is much more visible in the southeast. You see that Hasan Keif is the first place. I mean, we, we are not talking about Hagia Sophia or Topkapı Museum anymore. We are talking about Hasan Keif, and Zeugma has also uh, risen up. And Göbekli Tepe is above the average of, of the other places. Now, now it's our time to play this, this little game. Uh, you have your keypads. So our question to the communities, to the respondents, was uh, what old civilizations do you know lived and existed in Turkey? I would like you to guess the percentage of people who, who could name an older civilization that lived in today's Turkey. So what do you think is the percentage of our respondents, of these 3,600 people, who could come up with one, at least one, uh, civilization name? If you think that the percentage is between 0 and 15, press 1 on the keypad. If you think it's be between 15 to 30 percent, press 2 in the keypad. 30 to 45, 3, 45 to 60, 4, 6 to, to 85, 5, 85 between 100, 6. One question. Yes. Can One question. Of course. What do you mean by, like, how late is ancient? Is Ottomans? Come? Just before Turkish Republic. Oh, okay. so Ottomans are. Ottomans are also in the list. <laughs> can we, can we press? Can we press now? You can press. <laughs> Does anyone need more time? <laughs> Come in. <coughs> okay, let's see. So, um, the equal percentage of you have guessed that either between 15 to 30 percent or 45 to 60 percent. So I can tell you, if your guess was four, you were right. You are realistic. <laughs> if it was below four, you are a bit pessimistic. <laughs> if you are below four, you are a bit optimist. You can join me. <laughs> Above. Yes, we can get a bit of it. Here is the exact number. Okay, this was an easy one. It's going to get a little bit more complicated with the next question. But, I mean, it's going to be more complicated for me, not for you. <laughs> All right. Would you like to see which civilizations were named? That's also quite interesting. So this was an open-ended question, okay? I mean, we didn't, we didn't list anything. We didn't ask, oh, do you know about the Ottomans? Do you know? No. The question was very plain. 
Can you name any? So 47.7% said we don't know any. And then the first one that came was 13% Etilash. Yeah, not Hittites, because probably if we had listed them, we would, we would say Hittites, but is it, it is um, Etilash. And then the following one is Osmanlı, Ottomans. And then Lidyalılar, the Lidyans come in, Byzans, Sumerlar, Selçuklar, and others, because I mean there were really like 1% of many other answers that were grouped, <coughs> grouped into, into others. That's why I, when, I, when I said uh, it's interesting that Hattusha was so low in the, in the list <coughs> compared to other sites, because here we see that Etilar is quite famous, uh, but not anything related to Etilar is that. <laughs> now, I am moving to the second category of questions, which is the engagement, I mean, the engagement with archaeological assets. So how much do the archaeological assets touch their lives? Do they do, they do something? Do they go and visit? Uh, do they do any illicit digging? You know, all sorts of engagement really like um, being connected. And it, it doesn't only be have, to have to be the visiting, it can also be living close to an archaeological site. And with visiting, we ask all sorts of questions like the ownership of, our, of a museum card, entrance fees, better management options, tourism, treasure hunting. I'm, I'm selecting some of these questions, as you can you know, think that we are, I'm not able to present you all the, uh, all the answers. But if there is anything that you are curious, please do ask afterwards. We can have a look at the data. Experiences about archaeology, sources of information. So if they want to know, where do they go? What do they search for? Or education and whose responsibility that, the, that the, the society is educated about archaeology? Interest was another big group in this category. Knowing about human past. So we didn't only put it as archaeological assets. We also asked about human past in general. And this Erdevlet family tree, We'll come back to that. Objects with, with intangible value, interest in other cultures. And then the last category within the engagement uh, is the interpretations <coughs> about engagement itself. So this is the connection with older civilizations, the ideas of protection and conservation. So this question, while we were doing the brainstorming sessions in, in, in those places that I showed you the photos, was the one that the archaeologists wanted to know the most, because it was like if you if they live by an archaeological site, everything should be different. That's why we of course put this question, and I'll show you the interesting results. Bear with me, I'll I'll walk you through this. So 30 percent of the Turkish population said that they are living. Uh, there is an archaeological site nearby nearby where they are living. But if we look at the breakdown of this data, like who says what, we see that the rural, the, the settlement type, rural, um, urban, and metropolitan has a huge difference because most of the people that say, ah, there is an archaeological site close where I live, is coming from Kent, urban. This was already quite interesting. Then, if we read the data, I mean, there, there can be two reasons for this. First one is, I think it makes sense that me metropolitan is low, because the chances of living next to an archaeological site, if you're living in Istanbul, is quite low, geographically speaking. But with the, with the answers for, for, for the rural, <laughs> if we look at who gave more, uh, more positive answers, are those who call themselves modern and university, and mo within the modern, it's the higher income, more interest level, and a higher education, and I also put education there, university graduates. So it's not that they, it doesn't exist, it's not, it's not that mm, there is no archaeological site where they live, they do not know. So these are the two, two maybe important points when we are reading this answer as 30 to, to 70%. And of course, you can look at this data from millions of different perspectives, and you can, you know, put this on one angle and put another thing. The, well, the um, op opportunities are endless. The data is rich. Well, you would 
course, remember the tremendous demand for the, um, the um, family tree when the state made these records available online. Many people um, d decided to search for it. And this was one of the questions that came to our mind because we said, huh, this is about interest. But, I mean, we, we heard a lot of people talking about this, but is it really that that many people checked? So this is why we put it on the, on the questionnaire. Oh, sorry. 55%, more than half of the people who we asked said that they did check their family records. Oh my God, okay. This, this is an important question for us, <laughs> for all of us now. Um, this was the question that we discussed the most. And now we will do another exercise and then we are going to discuss it all together. So the question is, according to you, what civilizations have formed today's Turkey? Bugünün Türkiye'sini hangi medeniyetler meydana getirmiştir? Please keep in mind that there are four answers. This was not an open-ended question. So we gave the option of choosing one or another. So the 100 percentage is distributed among these answers. And there are four categories that I'm going to ask you to rate with your keypads. Mm -hmm. The first, if you, I would suggest that you think of all the answers now, like what is the percentage of people who would have said Turks, civilizations of hundreds of years, thousands of years, Muslims, Seljuks, Seljuks and Ottomans, and then we start the voting. Okay, just give you a second. The voting goes as it was before. Now the categories are from 0 to 10%, you press 1, and we are going to vote Turks. So what is the percentage of people, <coughs> of our respondents, who said Turks are the ones who formed today's Turkey yesterday? Could you choose more than one category? No. No, you had this, okay. Yeah. So that's why your, your, uh, your answer should add up to 100 in your mind. There's no questions uh, about Christianity. That'd be the next one. No. No, no, you just want to know. Yeah. Civilizations of thousands of years. Yeah. What we are Yeah. So, yeah. Do we vote? so you can vote for Turks now if you think from 0 to 10% of the population said Turks. What? 1 from 10 to 22, 20 to 30. Three. And if you think more than 60% said Turks, vote 6. So you can vote until 6. We are not going to uh, show the results before we do all the categories. Hocam, siz de vote ediyor musunuz? Hay Allah. Kim bütün sarat ediyor, eyvah. <laughs> Do you need more time? Everyone voted. Geçiyorum. Şimdi geçelim en sonunda hepsini göstereceğiz. Geçiyorum. So the second category, civilizations of thousands of years. <laughs> Tamamız galiba. Geçin. Tamam. Biraz daha vakti ihtiyaç var mı? Geçelim. Geçiyorum ben de. Muslims. Kaç 
Çok oldu. Ve I'm passing to the last category. <coughs> Selçuk's and Ottomans. <coughs> <laughs> okay. So, just a little. Turks. Okay. Forty to fifty percent. Just remember that you are more inclined towards forty to fifty percent. Bir sonrakine geçelim. 43%. Okay. This is going to be interesting. Yes. I'm keeping the results. Okay. 20 to 30% mostly. More or less. Bir de sonuncu göre. 20 to 30%. Sonuncusu Selçuk, Selçuk sen oturmuş, evet. Are you ready? Yes. This is going to be interesting. Forty-six percent of the population said civilizations of thousands of years. You were quite wrong. <laughs> So we were. <laughs> That's why I said this was the most interesting result for all of us. And uh, followed by Celtics and Ottomans, Turks, and then Muslims. Would you like to see a little bit more of this data? Because this is quite interesting. Okay. <coughs> so what happens here is you, you see the categories again, starting with Turks, uh, thousands of years, uh, Muslims and Seljuks and Ottomans. And, okay, let me state the obvious first. Modern, very very interested. That interest group, just in parenthesis, if you remember the first, <coughs> one of the first questions was, can you, uh, do you know of these, of these archaeological places? Those who knew from, from seven to, not, to ten places, we grouped them as very interested. And the ones that could name Four to seven to four to six, little interested, and the ones that were between zero to to three, we said they are not interested. So this is the interest group, and then the education level. Okay, so the modern um, and very interested university education says thousands of thousands of years of earlier civilizations as an answer to this question. What is maybe? Uh, more interesting to see is uh, the people who identify themselves as religious conservative, maybe you would have thought that they would say Muslims as the biggest category, but no. I mean, they say first Selçuks and Ottomans, but the second category is the same. Civilizations of thousands of years. So I think this is an important important piece of information to to look at. Because this is on the contrary of what most of us taught in this audience, including ourselves when we were asking the, the question. Hmm. This is another question that we like. And with this question, I would like to um, um, say thank you to Professor Dr. Cevat Erdar, because this is actually his question. And he has been so very supportive and helpful in the whole process because I remember as a student at Koç University, he came to one of our master class, master's classes uh, and he was the one who was talking about the need of doing such a public survey. And uh, he, he was very happy to follow all the steps and uh, tell us some questions. And he, he said, why don't you ask people whether there's any object that, that they keep in their house for its intangible value? And that's what we asked. Um, before telling you the results, showing you the result of, uh, too late, <laughs> too late, <laughs> there was one more thing there, but, okay, missing. 
Anyways, I'm, I'm going to say it anyways. Um, Konda, uh, on their website, has this um, a new toolbar called Interactive Konda. So if you Google, if you write interactive interactivekonda.com.tv, they have a lot of uh, their researchers, re researchers online, and one of the teams that you can have a look is the physical properties of the house and people's emotional attachment to that house. So this data, I think, can also be um, compared with that kind of data, and that's the good side of it, because, uh, for example, there are questions like, do you feel connected to the house that you are living? And the percentage is very high. It's like 80% of the people feel connected to, the, to, to their house, to their home, as well as to their neighborhood and to their city. So, kendinizi yaşadığınız şehre ait hissediyor musunuz? This is how they phrase the question. Here are, but our finding is only one person out of four has an object that has an intangible value, manevi there again, that they keep in their house. Um, th this is again when we, when we we have to go back and ask about this intangible. What does that intangible mean? But this is also interesting finding. Of course. When we say engagement, it's not only nice kind of engagement that we would like to see how people all go and visit and they want to know about what about, you know, illicit digging or finding something that might have um, economic value. So I would like to compare. We asked two different questions about this. The one, one of them was um, if you found a treasure full of um, <coughs> gold and silver coins, what would you do? And the second one, if you happen to find an archaeological object, <laughs> let's say pottery cup, nearby, in your field or nearby, what would you do? So uh, the highest category is, everyone is calling, the, half of the respondents almost are calling the police. Uh, it differs a little bit with the coins and the archaeological object, <laughs> because if the coins is at stake, then people who say, I would try to sell it, <laughs> doubles almost. Uh, and if it's an archaeological object, pe people who tend to say, I would hide it, right? For some reason, more po people would call the police if they were to find some coins. That's uh, also, these uh, smaller ones are 4% and 1%, the other end, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I think also no answer goes to nothing. No. Well. <laughs> okay. So I, w I was um, telling you that we also asked <coughs> some, um, like, questions about visiting the site. How many, of the, how many of these people have visited an archaeological site? And there are other kinds of engagements. So 48% said that they have visited an archaeological site. 12% have a museum card. 68% of these people think that people do not visit archaeological sites because of the high entrance fees. And 75% say they would call the police if they see an illegal excavation going on somewhere. Maybe they don't see it. So. <laughs> I would like to look at that 48%, actually not for that 48%, the 52%, mm -hmm. because there was a follow-up question. If you said, okay, I didn't go to an archaeological site, but the follow-up question asks you, would you like to go? I mean, do you have any plans? Do you have any plans? Are you uh, going to go? So the first category says, yes, I do. It's on my agenda. Don't worry, I'll go. It's, it's coming. Uh, the second category, I would if I had an opportunity. And their opportunity means, you know, if I had the money, if someone took me, I don't know how to behave in those. So all those things come in, in the opportunity package. And the third category is a closed door. No. And that's a definite no. So would you like to see who says what? So 20% of the people who did not visit an archaeological site says, it's on my agenda, no rush, I'll do it. 60% says, I wish I had the opportunity, take me to an archaeological site. 
and the 20% says no. And this also shows quite difference among the lifestyles, the self-identified lifestyles, right? Okay, let's look at, again, the, uh, the, the modern says, like 9% says, no, it's indefinite, no, I will not go. Uh, if you look at traditional conservative, it's, it increases to 19%. If you look at the religious conservative, it increases to 30%. So that's the difference. I personally would like to look at the 70% of the religious conservative who would go, and also that 81% of uh, traditional conservative who says, yes, I would go, rather than you know, looking here and getting, oh my God, so depressing. So I think it's a way of looking at the data. Last one, for the fun of it, because, okay, some of you are archaeologists in this room and you are so tired of the question of uh, a friend of mine found this, there is this map and do you know how to read? I know. So of course uh, this unstoppable demand to find uh, gold and becoming rich overnight is something that you encounter a lot. So we asked people like, okay, did you find it really? I mean, have you or you, anyone you know have found the treasure and become rich? Zenginleştinizmi, that was the Turkish word that we used. And now, with the keypad, again, uh, we, I would like you to make a guess on the percentage of people who said, yes, I found it, or a, a close relative, someone I know, found the treasure. From 0 to 10%, press 1, 10 to, 10 to 20, 2, 20 to 33, and then up, uh, above that, 4 you can vote. Come on. Just a second. To do that. Devam edebilirler. Tamam. Yeah, herkes. Tamam. Gö- gösterebilir miyiz? Değiştiriyorum şeyi. <gülüyor> That's quite accurate. Tamam, değiştirelim tekrar, sağ olun. Seven percent said yes. I will make sure to interview those seven percent as well. <gülüyor> okay, we are done with the keypads. Çok teşekkürler. And I'll uh, very, f- I have a couple of more slides to show you on the last um, component of the of the public survey. And this relates to general approaches. So the way we ask these questions are uh, scale questions. So how do you uh, rate this statement? How much do you agree to this statement? A strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree or disagree, and uh, agree, strongly agree, okay? So we uh, wanted to understand the ideas on works of foreign archeologists in Turkey, the ideas on the artifacts smuggled out of Turkey and what should be done with them, remains of the past that they see around as they, as one's own heritage or not, and the perceptions on destruction, like knowledge on what's going on in countries like Iraq and Syria, treasure hunting, is it seen as a crime, road and dam construction, and I'll show you the detailed results of this, or state support on archaeology. So these are the questions that you, and when you see the results, you'll also see that the, the, the answer is a little bit inflated. Like people are tend, they tend to be on the nicer side of things. They agree maybe a little bit more. But keep in mind that we can always cross-check this data with the earlier data that tells us more about interest and that tells us more about, you know, their visiting <coughs> habits, their engagements, which... I, I found the questions there more straightforward and honest because when you ask a person did you do this or not if you're not asking a very challenging question they don't, they don't usually lie I mean why would they lie if they did not go to an archaeological site 
But here they are more like, yeah, it should be like that kind of. These are more passive tense questions. One thing that was asked in one of the other researches about the environment, the protection of the environment, was very relevant for this research as well. So we wanted to know what people say about historical, historical artifacts could be sacrificed for road and dam construction. Because this is something that's being constantly reported, right? Peda edilebilir, this is the word. Disagree, very clear, disagree. Um, and that uh, 16% there is neutral, not really. But there is a very strong finding there. And a couple of things, a um, couple of statements. 49% uh, of the people approve, they agree, that works of foreign archaeologists in Turkey are beneficial for the development of archaeology. Almost 90% agree that artifacts smuggled abroad should be returned to Turkey. That's so very clear. 82% accept the archaeological remains as, they, as part of their own culture. 80% think that treasure hunting is a crime and should be prevented. And 67% uh, think that archaeological assets are not protected enough in Turkey. So, to conclude, um, 65 questions. This is a very rich set, set of data. I tried my best to try to synthesize and try to display the results which could be related to each other. And all with the aim of making this picture a bit more clearer in our minds. Because most of the time, we do have our own assumptions about what others think about archaeology, archaeological assets. But maybe a step towards making it more you know, readable is was one of the aims of this uh, of this survey. So, um, as I was trying to hint at, I, I'm more tempted to look at the more positive side of the data to to depart from, and so I think the better feeling, and to close it with a better feeling, I put something funny there. Thank you very much <laughs> for for your interest and your presentation. I think uh, that uh, it was not easy to present this uh, rich uh, amount and large amount of information uh, in a, in a 45 minutes lecture, but I think that uh, everybody will at least have had some interesting uh, elements presented. So and I'm assuming that there will be questions. So please, does anybody want to ask a question for further clarification? Yes. Uh, did you talk about uh, age differences? Uh, yes. Older people, middle-aged people, uh, younger adults, uh, yeah. and what, what, what did you find uh, there? Uh, uh, does schooling have an effect of watching? I, well, I have other questions. Uh, there is actually a difference, especially regarding the interest level, because when the age group is higher, the interest level drops. Younger people are much more interested mm -hmm. in, uh, in various things. It, it doesn't mean that they know more, because knowing more is very much linked to education. But wanting to know more or following news is very linked to, to age, and also the desire to go and visit a site. If uh, if the if it's a um, high age category, they say no, I I, I do not bother. But the younger people uh, tend tend to say yes, I will do. Yes. Um, how do you define an archaeological site for the question? Because you have Aya Sophia there, <coughs> yes, yeah, yeah, and you was had uh, Hassan Cave as well, so. Actually, we didn't draw 
very strict boundaries. And if you look at the way he asked this question, he kept changing the terminology. Archaeologic alan, archaeologic yer, öğren yeri, tarihi eser, eski eser. We, we tried to use as much as possible because we actually wanted to understand if there's going to be any reaction when we say öğren yeri, archaeologic yer, you know, if, if the word archaeology is in uh, the picture. So we, we did not, as I was saying, we did not say, okay, uh, Ayasofya doesn't count. It has to be a Sun cave. We thought more like, okay, what is going to ring the bell in people's minds? What is more likely of being known? Rather than being very um, sharp on the, on the categories. But did you define this for the, the persons to whom you were asking the question? No. 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 So no, it was very standardized. So standard. everyone felt when they were told that Hagia Sophia was an archaeological site. Yes, it, it was. Made a, this association. Hagia Sophia Musée. Böyle sordum. Museum. Uh, so museums yes. would fit into yes. the. Yes. 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 Because I, I personally would not consider Hagia Sophia an archaeological site, mm. but uh, yes, I. We use the official name of all the places that they. Any other questions? Did you show the, or did you tell the results of your research to the officials of the Ministry of Culture, and what were their reactions? Not yet. This is the first time uh, that we are <coughs> presenting, uh, but we, we will uh, as a report, and if there is, because we we communicated the uh, the existence of this demand, uh, event. They couldn't make it this time, but probably there will be other times that will be presented to them, but also <coughs> as a policy recommendations booklet. Because actually, when we asked people, like, who is the, what, which, which institution is responsible for educating people about archaeology in Turkey, 40-something, uh, 45 percent of the respondents said the ministry. So and it's the highest percentage. So it cannot go, you know, ignored... Uh, so we, we will definitely do that. That's the next step. The results will also be made available online. No, it will can, can I get a copy of it, your research? Thank you. Of course, the big. Yes? No, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question about these categories, um, modern, get an excel, mm -hmm. artist or card, new artist or card. Um, you said they were self-selecting. Mm -hmm. So how how did you phrase it? And if so, did people fall? <coughs> did, did people literally many many people all say exactly modern, or did they use versions of that? And likewise, did they use versions and you group them mm -hmm. into those three categories? Uh, they were already defined categories. So you ask people, I'm going to read you three things. Which one suits you the most? So you might be a bit like ya yeah, modern de demeseydim kendime başka bir şey olsaydım ben ama okay modern is the closest so you would end up there. So there were three strict categories and people people were read these categories and then they choose. Probably because Bond already had this. Yes. 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 No, that, yes. Those are not our uh, no. groupings. That's Bond's standard. Um, you know, way of dividing sociology of Turkey today. So when they're doing the election polling, for instance, mm -hmm. yeah, they do, do the same. Yeah, yeah. Again. Yeah. 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 Well, I have, I have, yeah. sorry, yeah. I have, I have the same questions about the, the categories and the demographics. So, so that question is already uh, <laughs> answered. So I'd just like to um, congratulate you for a great, uh, great talk, and it's. Uh, um, very encouraging to see that it's a uh, very well spent um, grant <laughs> and, and money. So, uh, so uh, well done. Uh, I would like to also ask a question about the definitions. Uh, there was a very interesting outcome in one of the questions, and it was the what was what have formed the modern Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, thinking about what was the definition in people's mind about thousands of years of civilization, mm -hmm. because I think I was I was not very optimistic about that uh, outcome. So I think like many people think thought about uh, thousands of years of Turkish history, thousands of years of Muslim mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any? Uh, Definitions in people's minds. 
I cannot answer this question at this stage, but this is going to be something that we are going to ask in the in-depth interviews, because actually we just formulated those four headings and we asked people to choose one. Uh, but what they thought of this uh, whole bunch is going to be something further to investigate. I mean, I can tell you what I think, but I cannot uh, be very First, first, Gerkan. Okay, I, I really wonder that if you contact any cultural resource management company before you start your survey, or did you contact any professional archaeologist who's working at heritage management project before? Yeah, uh, those were why, that was why we did the yeah, brainstorming. So the first slide, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there were four uh, meetings, yeah. uh, and we discussed our ideas, and then we... Uh, yeah, we went with that information to follow to find the question. There were more questions. Yes, for you. Uh, where the people who filled out these forms selected or recruited? Honda uh, works with their own. Okay, this is this is a question that I'm going to answer on behalf of the of the company. Uh, but we did go and talk with a lot of companies, and this. Uh, Honda, since they have their own people doing this, doing the, um, um, the, the implementation of the survey itself, they do not outsource this to another company. That's why uh, we felt much more secure, because they have more control over their people. But the, the forms and the questionnaires were so standardized and checked constantly that uh, I think that eliminated the... Uh, the possibility of you know manipulating the questions or asking it in a different way or helping the respondent or guiding the respondent in a, in a certain way. Uh, but maybe I can add a bit more on this. Uh, what we call them anketer in Turkish, these people who go and actually ask the questions and fill the forms. Um, usually they are university students or 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 maybe about. And um, in Konda's case, um, they mostly employ them from the region, so it is not like a team from Istanbul goes to all these places. And um, I cannot be sure about um, the period, but they uh, they don't keep them forever. They renew them. I don't know every six months or something like that because they don't want the people to get so used to the job and kind of know the tricks and you know maybe go sit down in a coffee house and fill the forms themselves so to avoid all these things um, they do very um, I think strict trainings but also very strict control and the way it's implemented uh, over a weekend for all of Turkey it starts a Saturday morning finishes on a uh, Sunday evening so it was done on um, May 7th and 8th. Mm -hmm. 11, 12. 11, 12. Proceed and the bonus, please. There is no first question on the question. We have a separation like that. Turks and Sartreks and Ottomans. What's the difference? Turks and Turks is in a slow copper category. You put that Sartreks and Ottomans in another category. So, mm -hmm. what is the difference? We wanted to understand actually if it is going to make any difference in people's responses. So these are not the categories that you know we are offer. We are um, very sharp. Huh? Suggesting. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but uh, we wanted to see if people are going to respond differently when they hear the word Turk or when they when they hear the word Sajuks and Ottomans. So this was uh, the one of the reasons why we asked that question in that way. Okay. Uh, okay, I want to add something. Uh, first of all, with the selling antiquities, uh, because the coins they can sell more, and, but not archaeological objects, uh, you can sell the coins uh, for Ottoman enterers uh, easily, and it is not uh, it's illegal, let's mm -hmm. say, because in the law it says you can sell the Ottoman emperor's coins, so the, probably they were knowing that uh, regulation somehow, and then they were selling the coins, they were trying to sell anyway. Uh, that, that, and the second thing, and we were working in Gobekli Tepe, 
uh, and then in the village near Göbekli Tepe, uh, the children uh, doesn't know the Göbekli Tepe and what archaeologists doing there. Uh, however, their father was working with us in the excavation, uh, and then we uh, we went, uh, we talked with the uh, teacher, and then we went there, and then we educated the people, and then. Uh, to take them from the village and to Shanulfa and then visited the museum and the Halek River. And then they realized that somehow that archaeological assets are goes to museum and then they are very valuable and then interesting. Mm -hmm. Now the Minister of Education and the Minister of Minister of Culture and Tourism made the protocol last week uh, about this education, uh, the children about mm -hmm. the archaeological uh, assets and the museums. So probably the results can change, can change sooner <laughs> because of the children can teach their father and mother and their yeah. learning. Yes. That's so a very promising. Yes. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hope it will change soon. So Hopefully we can, do the, yeah. we can do the survey again and we yeah. can compare <laughs> <laughs> the data that the children grow up. It is? Well, you probably you may not know the answer to this question, but um, was there a way to find out whether there was any public interest among the people who answered the questions to find out about the results? Were they curious about what you were doing? Did they want to know? I really don't know. That's why that's... But we can, we can ask. Actually, no. Uh, I might have an answer. Because like 10% of the people agreed to be interviewed again. I would think, this is an assumption, I would think that they are the ones who would like to know the results because otherwise they would just close the door and say, I don't want to see you anymore in my life again. So I, I, I am just, you know, assuming that the answer to your question is around 10 to 15 percent. Uh, just a question around um, what the next stage is. And you talked about uh, presenting the findings <coughs> and et cetera, but I just wondered, and perhaps leading to some sort of policy change, but I wondered what, what exactly um, we would be to kind of achieve on the back of this um, survey. Yeah, that was one of the reasons why uh, we wanted to do, sur to do the survey in the first place, but also to be able to contribute to the capacity building, and this cannot be done by ignoring all the authorities that you were referring to. So. Uh, I mean, if anything is going to change, it has to involve the parties. But I mean, we are not claiming that we are going to do the change itself overnight. And but uh, this is this is an important piece of data, and it can be presented in a in a way that is very, you know, to the point. But that's what I meant with the policy recommendation. And then it is going to be made available. But I cannot guarantee the rest. Also, it's a, a baseline for all people working on heritage management that was always missing because people were always assuming. That's really it. I mean, uh, are the 46% that said like uh, uh, civilizations over a thousand years, we were, we were really surprised. So, but I mean, everybody's always talking about what people think, normal people on the street or uh, think, but that's not necessarily true. So therefore it was, for Turkey, it has never been done, so it's the first time that this kind of data are being generated, and they are normally they should be of interest to people working with heritage management, museums, everybody, even people working with, in tourism. So it is actually a data um, set that is going to be used not only in academia but much wider. I think that there are probably more questions, but I also think that we should, for now, leave it. And we would like to invite all of you to celebrate the fact that you just attended the inaugural lecture <laughs> with a glass of bubbles. Uh, we thought that uh, a glass of cider would be not go bad, not go wrong. So everybody's invited now for a glass of something with something to go with the glass. <laughs> and normally an inaugural lecture is more like a general repetition, but I think that today the Shlav did much better than a general repetition. So I would like to thank you once again for the lovely lecture and all of you to come and please enjoy the lecture.